Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you. Thank you each and every one of you for being here with us today for the first COVID-19 plenary and inviter speaker session, The Impact of COVID-19 Beyond Health. I'm Professor Chris Byrer, uh, Professor of Epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and a past president of the International AIDS Society. The session uh, aims at exploring the multiple effects and impacts that COVID-19 and the response to COVID-19 has had in our world outside the health sector. So looking at all of the other uh, important domains uh, with expert perspectives from thought leaders in the fields of human rights, infectious diseases, food security, economics, political science, and really looking beyond just the pandemic and also looking at the impacts of our response to the pandemic. Today you'll hear one keynote speaker and then five invited speakers on different aspects of COVID and the COVID response. And I will see you all again at the end of their presentations in the conclusion of this session. I'm delighted to say that our keynote speaker is uh, the Honorable Mrs. Mary Robinson the first woman president of Ireland. She is now an adjunct professor for climate justice at Trinity College, Dublin. She's chair of the elders group, which has been such an important body uh, advising the world on issues like climate change and the pandemic response. Um, she is also a past uh, commissioner of the UN uh, Human Rights uh, Council. She uh, received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from U.S. President Barack Obama. Between 2013 and 2016, she served as the U.N. Secretary General's Special Envoy for three different roles, for the Great Lakes region of Africa, on climate change, and most recently as the U.N. Special Envoy on El Nino and climate change. She will be followed then by uh, our five invited speakers, a distinguished group uh, of scientists, economists, and, and political leaders, really from across the spectrum. Uh, first off will be Professor Paolo Sirico from the London Business School. He's a professor of economics, uh, and he is also a research associate at the London uh, School of Economics Center for Macroeconomics. Before joining the London Business School, he was an advisor on monetary policy to the Bank of England. So uh, he is, of course, going to speak to us about issues related to Brexit, income inequality, climate change, the rise of populism, and how all of those features have been impacted by the COVID pandemic. He will be followed by Professor Andrea Gagliotti, also from the London Business School. Uh, he is a professor of economics at the European University in Florence as well. He's an expert in microeconomics, industrial organization, and game theory. And he is also the managing editor of the Review of Economic Studies. He will be followed by my friend and colleague, Professor Sir Andy Haynes. Uh, Andy Haynes was director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine from 2001 until 2010. He's a member of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for the second and third assessment exercises and was review editor for the health chapter in the fifth global assessment. He chaired the scientific advisory panel for the 2013 World Health Report uh, for the WHO and he also chaired the Rockefeller Commission on Planetary Health which helped found that new field and for which I was honored to serve as a commissioner. He will be followed by Dr. Sherry Wieser from the University of California San Francisco. She's a professor of medicine and an internist at UC uh, San Francisco's Division of HIV. Um, her research focuses on the impact of food insecurity and other social and structural factors on treatment outcomes of HIV and other chronic diseases. She's published multiple manuscripts in the food insecurity area, and she's going to talk to us about the food insecurity impacts of COVID-19, which of course have been so substantial in so many low and middle income countries, and indeed in some high income countries like my own, the United States, where income inequality has already been a sharp, uh, sharp divide uh, and where COVID-19 and its uh, impacts have really exacerbated food insecurity, even in a country as wealthy as the United States. Finally, our last speaker will be the Honorable Mrs. Laura Chinchilla. She was the first woman to be elected president of Costa Rica 
from 2010 to 2014. Previously, she had served as a Minister of Public Security, as a Congresswoman, as Costa Rica's Minister of Justice, and also as the Vice President of her country. She's a fellow at the Institute of Politics and, Policy, uh, uh, and Public Policy at Georgetown University here in the States, uh, and also is an invited professor at the Instituto Tecnologico de Monterrey, in Mexico, and the University de San Paulo in Brazil. So a true internationalist, and she is going to speak to us about the political implications uh, of COVID-19, again, beyond the health response, and of course, unfortunately, uh, Central and South America currently are being extremely hard hit by the COVID pandemic, uh, with Brazil being the second most affected country in the world after my own. So truly a distinguished panel. Uh, and as I said in my introduction, I will be back to see you again after uh, the Honorable uh, Mary Robinson's keynote and these five wonderful talks. Thank you for your attention and look forward to an extraordinary session with some really very, very special invited speakers. I'd like to thank the International Aid Society for the invitation to take part in this virtual COVID-19 conference. I chose the title COVID-19, a mirror to help plan a better future. And I want to explain why I chose this title. And I want to go back to January of this year, 2020. I was feeling very depressed and down because I was very concerned about the climate conference, cli climate crisis, and I didn't see that the world was really ready to have that ambition that was needed. And I'm chair of the elders that Nelson Mandela brought together and we're not allowed to be depressed and down. We have to bring hope. So I was disguising how depressed I felt, but I actually was very worried because I couldn't see how we would get on track for a safe world for our children and grandchildren, despite the children being out there in their millions for Fridays for Future, begging us to listen to the science and to be prepared to uh, do something. We knew from the Paris Climate Agreement, and I was the special envoy of the UN Secretary General at the time, that we had to reach a goal of well below two degrees Celsius of warming and preferably work for 1.5 degrees. But actually, at the time of the Paris Agreement, the climate scientists hadn't studied what the difference was between a world of two degrees and a world of 1.5 degrees. So they were asked by the Paris Climate Agreement to answer that question. And if necessary, if we had to stay at 1.5 degrees, what did this mean? And the scientists very clearly for once as climate scientists answered those questions in a report in October, 2018. They explain that there is a very big difference between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees because in that band of time very difficult things happen. The coral reefs will probably more or less disappear. The Arctic ice will probably be more or less gone and the permafrost and there's a lot of permafrost will melt and throw up not just carbon but also methane which is even more dangerous in the shorter term. It's happening at the moment in Siberia in the heat this summer um, of the permafrost melting. So all of these things are happening more quickly. So the conclusion of the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Scientists of Climate Change was that the whole world must stay at or below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And they said it is doable if we have the political will. And what needs to be done is to ensure that we reduce by 45% carbon emissions by 2030. In October 2018, they said you have 12 years. Now we know we have less than 10 years. And that was what worried me in January. And then all of a sudden, and in a way that we hadn't anticipated in any way, the whole world began to be hit by COVID, starting with China, and other countries in Asia, but moving pretty rapidly into Italy and into other countries, and now the whole world. It has devastated us. It has turned the world upside down. It began by being an acute health crisis with many deaths, many illnesses, hospitals overflowing, 
And then it became an economic crisis because of the need for lockdown in countries and social distancing um, and other practices. And uh, it is not a great leveler. Uh, COVID-19 has actually exacerbated all of the inequalities that were there in our world. It has exacerbated the inequalities um, of poverty and race. And what's something that um, the feminist movement has understood is the intersection between those many equalities, between poverty, inequality, race, gender, being a migrant or a refugee, being somebody with disabilities, being in an abusive household where you can't socially distance or get out of the household and you're abused more, um, being a girl out of school in the developing world where you're pushed into child marriage because you're never going to go back to school, all of these inequalities. So that's what I call the mirror of COVID-19. And it's a mirror to the climate injustice that I've been particularly focused on. And I just wanted to outline briefly what I call five layers of that climate injustice. And there probably are more, but let's look at those five. The first one is that the poorest countries in the world and small island states and indigenous communities are disproportionately affected by climate change, even though they're not responsible for the emissions. They don't drive cars, they don't have major manufacturing, they don't have central heating. And yet, when I started being aware as a human rights person working in Africa of the link between climate change and human rights, I really saw that disproportionate impact. So that's the first injustice. The second one is within that, the gender dimensions of climate change. Women have different social roles. They've much less power. They don't have land rights in many countries. They don't have access to assets, to training, to try and cope with all of this. And yet they're the ones who more or less have to put food on the table, have to go further in drought for the water or for the firewood. So that's the gender injustice. And uh, the third injustice is the one, the third layer of injustice is the one that children have been reminding us of under Greta Thunberg for the last two years, the intergenerational injustice. They have begged us not to listen to them because they're just children, but to listen to the science and to be serious and to take the steps that are necessary so that they will have a livable future. I, 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 I was in the UN General Assembly when Greta Thunberg made that harrowing speech in which she said, I, you know, she, she was so angry. Um, and I understood, she was only 16 at the time, and I felt, you know, I was in tears listening to her. She shouldn't, she and other children shouldn't have to do that. And yet that was the responsibility they had to take because of that intergenerational injustice. The fourth layer of injustice is more subtle, but actually very significant. It's the injustice of the pathways to development of different parts of the world. The industrialized world had a pathway of fossil fuel. That's how we built up our economies. And now our challenge is to wean ourselves off fossil fuel and move to a clean economy, but do it with just transition, with funding to support and retrain workers who built up our economy, the workers in coal and oil and gas and peat in my own country. Um, so they mustn't be forgotten as we trans make the transition. But what about developing countries? I was the special envoy of the UN Secretary General at the time of the Paris Agreement. And before it, all countries made commitments and developing countries one after the other made commitments to go as green as possible, clean energy as possible. But they said, we will need the technology, we will need the investment, we will need the training, we will need the skills, we need the solidarity. And actually they haven't had that much support to go as green as they would wish. And meanwhile, they've been finding reserves of oil and gas in particular, but also coal. They probably already knew the coal was there. So what are they to do? They've got to bring the people out of poverty. Are they to go the dirty route and endanger the whole world? Or will we help them enough? That's another challenge of climate justice. And the fifth challenge, I have to honestly say is the one I came to much later, but is so important, is the injustice to nature it's herself. Um, look at that biodiversity report 
in May 2019, telling us what we were doing to our world, the potential extinction of a million species, the fact that we weren't living in a way that was sustainable with Mother Earth. We were uh, endangering the planetary boundaries. Uh, we were just not taking into account the loss of biodiversity and the uh, way in which this was affecting all aspects of life and the future. So combining these five layers of injustice then, what are the lessons that we can learn from COVID-19? Because it has been both devastating and exacerbated the inequalities, but it has also been a moment to learn lessons. So we've all been locked down in our different parts of the world in different circumstances of great inequality, but nonetheless, um, there's been something leveling about the fact that we've had to comply with staying locked down at the beginning of this COVID-19. And the more we've done that, the more it has addressed the virus because we don't have a vaccine. It's our collective behavior in obeying the lockdown and social distancing, which is helping to protect those more vulnerable, elders like myself, but also health workers and care workers and frontline cleaners, all those key workers, many of them women who are often low paid, but they are the key workers in an emergency, which is something also to remember. And collective human behavior will be very important when we are coming out of COVID-19 in addressing the other climate, the other crisis which hasn't gone away, the climate crisis, because we need to think about the kind of throwaway, plastic-ridden society that had developed. Very different from what I grew up with, where we learned to, to, to darn, we learned to sew buttons, we learned to have hand-me-down clothes. I'm now moving back to wanting that kind of world again. I'm going to get into slow fashion. I'm a jackets person. I have enough jackets to last me for the rest of my life. I'm just going to put a few away. I haven't changed size. I'll take them out and recycle them and um, that will do me. I've gone off meat. I, I'm a pescatarian. Um, little things. Most importantly, I'm going to travel much less. These are all things that I am learning that uh, in my behavior. If all of us could take some lessons in our collective behavior, that will help greatly as we address the climate crisis. The second lesson of COVID is that government matters. Uh, it matters a great deal. We are actually witnessing very visibly good government and government that has not taken the crisis seriously enough. Now, there is a mixture between those countries that do it democratically and those who do it more forcefully, if I could say, and I'm not too much in favor of that. But interestingly, it is women-led countries that have actually tended to do better um, in the democratic uh, space. Uh, countries like, for example, Angela Merkel in Germany, yes, they've had a resurge, but they're coping with it. Um, the prime ministers of Norway, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Jacinda Ardern, yes, um, uh, New Zealand was free of the virus and it's come back a bit, but they're coping. And the president of Taiwan, these women took tough decisions early, listened to the science and brought their people with them and then began to ease up. And they're seeing some problems that we can all learn from because other countries that are coming out later need to know. But think of the countries, including rich countries, where you've had bad, lazy or inattentive um, government not paying attention to the science or wanting their personal ambition, um, their election ambitions to outweigh taking seriously, and um, populist leaders who really have been very dangerous for their people. The verdict on them will be very cruel as we go forward because it will be very, very evident what countries coped well and did not. And there is no excuse for those countries that didn't pay attention to the science, didn't have the testing and tracing, didn't have the um, steps to protect their populations. So government matters. And the children will be delighted to think that maybe science matters much more now. Uh, because look, we've been watching many countries with politicians side by side with their health experts, and the health experts have been guiding them on the steps to be taken, how long will the lockdown be, what phase is next, how will we come out of COVID? It's been the science, the health science, that has guided us. We need to get into that relationship with climate scientists. We really do, so that the science guides us to get to where we need to be in having a good world uh, for the future. 
And then another thing, and it's a more subtle thing, but I, I like to talk about it. I believe that compassion matters. I think that COVID has had an impact on all of us, locked with our families, learning those relationships again, coping with a lot of issues, especially in abusive households, very negative issues. But by and large, it has opened us to the suffering of others. It has made us more empath have more empathy for that suffering. When I would talk in the past about climate justice, and I would refer to small island states and indigenous peoples and the poorest countries, people often looked at me quite blankly, more or less saying, well, that's not me. And they didn't really empathize. Now I think we, we have this kind of openness to the suffering of others, an openness to the fact that it is devastating, more devastating for countries in Africa, for example, because they're not getting remittances, because those who were sending remittances are out of a job in the industrialized parts of the world. The capital has flown from African countries. Um, they need enormous debt relief. We need a huge solidarity. What we need in building back better, and that's the, 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 the next part of what I wanted to talk about, um, we need to ensure that uh, we have a recovery package, not just for the rich countries and the European Union's recovery package, which is really remarkable, but also for the um, G20 moving in for the rest of the world with debt relief of a very significant sort and a recovery package that recognizes that it affects poorer countries so devastatingly. And then we need the two ways to come out of uh, the climate crisis. We need the new Green Deal, Green New Deal, with its clean energy and its clean jo green jobs. And we need the biodiversity, the reforesting, the rewilding, the drawdown um, recommendations of how we address that issue. And we need to do it um, not only fairly, but in a way that uh, really uh, recognizes that the business as usual was not a good world in many, many ways. It was not leading to a safe world because it was not dealing with the climate crisis, but it was a very unfair world. Now we've learned how vulnerable humanity is. Can we learn the first article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. So as Chair of the Elders, I want really to ensure that my message to you is a hopeful one. And I want to end with a succinct phrase by the Chair of the Elders, or sorry, the founder of the Elders, Nelson Mandela. The way he put it, and we have a big challenge in front of us, he said, it always seems impossible until it is done. It always seems impossible until it is done. Thank you. Welcome to everybody. I am Andrea Galeotti, and I will present, together with my colleague Paolo Surico, the economics of a pandemic. COVID-19 led to a crisis within a crisis. Back in February, at the outset of COVID-19, many countries realized the need to flatten the contagion curve in order to contain fatalities and to cope with limited healthcare system capacity. With the absence of vaccine, specific medical treatments, and with many countries with limited testing capacity, the only feasible alternative was to restrict social interaction and lock down the society and the economy. A direct consequence, we encounter a new curve, the recession curve. In the same way in which epidemiologists designed policy to flatten the contagion curve, so economists designed policy to flatten the recession curve. But what are the different forces that transform an health crisis into a global economic recession? The cash flow spiral helps understanding exactly this. First and foremost, COVID-19 creates uncertainty. The left-hand side graph plots an index of uncertainty, which is based on the frequency of newspaper articles with one or more terms about economic policy and uncertainty in roughly 2000 US newspaper. It is an index constructed by Bakker et al. The index spikes at 9-11, at the 2008 financial crisis, at Brexit, at Trump election, but it has an unprecedented spike at the outset of COVID-19. Second, as the economic environment becomes uncertain, jobs start disappearing. This is shown in the right-hand side graph where U.S. unemployment claims spike in a way that is unprecedented over the last 50 years. Uncertainty and unemployment affects, in turn, 
the cash flows of households that cut back consumption. But then this reduced demand for firms, both the firms serving consumer, but also the firms upward in the supply chain of production. Such a drop in demand creates cash flow problems for firms, creating a vicious and dangerous cycle. These last two effects, how households and firms react to a pandemic, are often difficult to quantify. Economists quantify these effects relying on national statistics that are available from three to four weeks up to, for some data, two months. But the design adequate policies require having and being able to quantify these effects in real time. And no one better than my colleague Paolo Surico, who has developed original and path-breaking results exactly on this during this pandemic, can talk about such real-time indicators. Paolo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andrea. What I'm going to show in uh, um, the next few minutes is what we've been put together looking at high-frequency bank transaction data from a large fintech company in the UK. This refers to household average weekly consumer spending. Each data point, each dot in this chart, refer to weekly expenditure. The blue line is 2020, the red line is 2019. The vertical line represents the start of the lockdown on the 23rd of March in the UK, and the first form of lockdown easing is the green vertical line on the 15th of May. The point I want to take from this chart is that A, the drop is unprecedented. The blue line the, draw a very sharp contraction of consumer spending in the order of magnitude between 30 or 40 percent if you go from peak to throw. The second point I want to make is that the drop in consumption starts much earlier than the lockdown measure. Before the lockdown into 23rd of March, before social distancing was announced on the 16th of March. This suggests that fear and uncertainty, people that were precautionarily saving for the uncertainty coming, or people that were afraid simply to get contagious, prevent them from going out and spending even before the lockdown measure per se. Another very useful information that we can gather from this transaction data user by user, each which type of user is contributing more to the drop in aggregate consumption. What you see on the left hand side is spending by different portion of the income distribution. The blue line refers at the top of the income distribution, the green line refers to the bottom of the income distribution. What is apparent is that households at the top of the income distribution have dropped their spending by much more, as large as 300 pounds a week, whereas also that are at the bottom of the income distribution is more on the order of magnitude of 100 to 150 percent. Why this is important? Because most of the consumption basket at the top of the income distribution is on non-essential goods, retail, restaurant, traveling, hospitality, recreation, whereas at the bottom of the income distribution most of the basket is on essential. We can go as far as asking how much each group contributed to the drop in aggregate consumption. And the striking feature of the UK, but also many other economies, is the top 25% of the income distribution account for 46% of the drop in aggregate consumption. Why this is important? Because if you look at each individual sector, you see that there are gainers and that there are losers. And what are the sectors that have lost most? Retail, transportation, restaurant, hospitality, recreation. Why? Because the richest household that have most of their spending in this non-essential sector have dropped their spending more. But who is employed by those sectors? Those are exactly the low earner. Those are exactly the people at the bottom of the income distribution that are seeing the largest drop, the largest decline in income. This implies that there is a short circuit. There is a large amount of saving at the top of the income distribution that is preventing to reach and consume on those sectors which employ low income earners, which therefore do not receive their income as a result of the fact that high income households have dropped their spending in those categories. 
So what we have learned from the economic experience that this crisis is unprecedented. An order of magnitude as we have never seen before, much larger than the Great Recession of 2007-2009. High earners are the ones that are contributing most to the drop in consumption and they are using these to increase their saving. They can do that because most of their basket is on non-essential goods and services like restaurant, traveling and so on and so forth. At the other end of the out of income distribution, low earners are seeing a larger decrease in their income, but they can drop their consumption by much less because most of their basket is on essential items. In other words, they are forced to increase their borrowing to put food on their table. But crucially, the low earners are seeing a larger drop in their income because they are employed in those very sectors restaurant, transportation, hospitality, recreation, in which the high income household are dropping their consumption most. Any economic policy that want to drive us away from the recession and into a recovery needs to break this short circuit between high income household with a large marginal propensity to save and low income household with a large marginal propensity to consume. Thank you very much. The COVID-19 pandemic has triggered very wide spread changes in human behavior. And it's also taken away attention from another crisis, which is also building, which is the climate crisis, which is on a different time scale to COVID-19, but nonetheless, a, a crisis which will have very far reaching implications for humanity unless we uh, address it. So COVID-19 has triggered uh, economic recession, unparalleled for many, many decades, and it's brought into very sharp focus the need for recovery policies. And these recovery policies must integrate health, equity, and sustainability. Governments around the world have imposed policies which essentially are costing the world economy many trillions of dollars in order to protect public health. So in emerging from the COVID-19 crisis, it makes sense to continue safeguarding health through appropriate policies for the economy, for the environment and human health. You can see from this slide that dramatic changes in the economy are occurring and are predicted to continue. And that if anything, in percentage terms, they're likely to have very big effects in both the advanced and the emerging economies. Obviously, the emerging economies, because people, more people are living below the poverty line, they like to have big impacts um, on the poor. But paralleling the, the COVID crisis, we've also seen decreases in air pollution in many countries. It depends a little bit where we are in the world and which pollution, pollutant we're looking at. But in many cases, the changes have been very dramatic. And this slide just illustrates one of those, and that's in, in India. As you can see, the nitrogen dioxide levels over India have declined quite dramatically between January and late March, uh, early April. And that's resulted in uh, a view of the Himalayas from parts of northern India that have not been seen for many, many decades. And this phenomenon has been seen, of course, in other situations as well. In many parts of the world, we've seen uh, people commenting on how nature has rapidly rebounded during the COVID crisis. And the question then is whether we can sustain these changes over time. So this is a slide from a recent paper in Nature Climate Change, which shows us how the CO2 emissions, and CO2 is the most important greenhouse gas, has uh, declined during the COVID pandemic. You can see that China, as we would expect, has preceded the rest of the world, uh, and that uh, uh, that's the bump on, on the left there in February, and that surface transport has contributed the largest, but other sectors as well, industry, power, aviation, and of course, public sector as well, with a modest increase in residential energy use and therefore CO2 emissions, CO2 being the most important greenhouse gas. As I mentioned, uh, China shows a different pattern to other parts of the world. It uh, decreased uh, earlier, but started to um, rebound earlier as well. And then the USA uh, and Europe 
following behind with the USA probably going to be having um, a longer trail because it's still in many parts of the country um, in lockdown. So there's no reason, unfortunately, to suppose that as we emerge from COVID, that CO2 emissions will necessarily remain low, or nor will air pollution in the absence of policies that guide the economy towards a zero carbon um, future. So what are the risks from climate change, unabated climate change? Well, these are manifold. I don't have time to go into detail, but this is from the IPCC 1.5 degree report. And you can see that as temperatures increase towards two degrees, which many climatologists tell us is the threshold which we must remain below, ideally, but 1.5, then the risks escalate. And they're summarized on this slide. Many of them have implications for human health, including direct effects of heat, coastal flooding, uh, food, crop yields, and so on. So in the face of this climate emergency, which is coming very rapidly over the horizon at us, which will impact on many, all parts of the world, but particularly, of course, on low middle income countries who have in many cases contributed least to greenhouse gas emissions. The WHO has launched a manifesto for a healthy green recovery, which includes six points summarized on this slide, including the protection and preservation of nature, investing in essential services, including healthcare, of course, ensuring a quick, healthy energy transition through zero carbon energy economy, promoting healthy, sustainable food systems, building livable, sustainable, low carbon cities, and importantly, stop using our money, taxpayers' money, to fund pollution. At the moment, we put about 40, 400, sorry, $400 billion a year direct subsidies into fossil fuels. So we're subsidizing pollution, we're subsidizing climate change, and we have to stop that. Nature-based solutions are important for health and for sustainability. Here's some examples on this slide. Forest conservation can reduce disease risks, that is in Brazilian Amazon and elsewhere, have shown reduced air pollution, decreased malaria transmission, cleaner water. Restoring air ecosystems can regulate fresh water, and provide better flood protection in the case of mangroves, for example. So these are solutions which can help sustain the environment, lock in carbon, help us adapt to climate change and variability and improve health. There are big co-benefits from decarbonizing the world economy. The top part of the slide shows you the uh, deaths that would be averted if we could decarbonize, if we could just take out fossil fuels from the world economy about 3.6 million premature deaths a year, something of that order. And you can see large numbers of premature deaths averted over China, India, Europe, and North America, less so over Africa, because they consume less fossil fuels. But if we add in some of the other emissions like agricultural land use burning and so on, domestic emissions, uh, then the numbers increase, as you can see in the bottom part of the slide, about 5.6 million deaths a year. What could cities do to adapt and mitigate to climate change? Summarized in this slide, efficient public transport, a bit more of a challenge after COVID, but we have to work out ways of making public transport safer, and particularly more active travel, walking and cycling, enabling people to maintain social distance, clean energy, water sanitation, safe housing, and green spaces as well. And then diets and food systems, don't have time to go into detail, but the slide shows you the recommendations of the Eat Lancet Commission, uh, which have followed uh, what they call their planetary health diet with more fruit and vegetables, less dependence on ruminant meat and, and dairy products, more whole grains and so on. They suggest this could prevent 10 to 11 million premature deaths a year by 2050 and help us to keep within planetary boundaries. There's widespread uh, public support for a climate friendly recovery in the most recent opinion polls summarized here, and you can see that this is particularly pronounced in some of the low middle income countries, but there's a majority in all countries, including the US, Great Britain, Germany, um, and others, as you can see from this slide. So the public is supporting political action, to phase out subsidies to uh, put us on a low carbon transition. And there are a number of ways in which we can do that. Uh, we can stop, as I've said before, subsidizing pollution and, and climate change. And setting prices at fully efficient levels would cause lower, much lower CO2 emissions and also cut air pollution deaths. And we can stop bailing out polluting industries, which uh, 
need to stand on their own two feet and stop being subsidized by taxpayers. And so we need to recapitalize companies, not only according to economic criteria, but also on the basis of environmental and health criteria. And at the moment, only a minority of rescue packages actually do that. So we need to ensure that these criteria are tailored to the needs of our current situation. So the health professions increasingly are aware of the need for urgent action. And uh, the end of May, uh, the leaders of over 40 million health professionals wrote to G20 political leaders to ask them to put public health at the core of the COVID-19 recovery, uh, including environmental sustainability, uh, low carbon energy, um, and of course, supporting uh, health systems. So then we need to move towards COP26, which is the Conference of the Parties, the 26th Conference of the Parties of the Climate Change uh, Treaty. That's been postponed to Glasgow uh, in 2021. And there will be a strong health presence at that conference. Uh, in 2020, we'll be having a virtual conference organized by the WHO, the Global Climate and Health Alliance and others, which will set the scene for the Glasgow conference. And then in Glasgow, we need to ensure that all governments raise their ambitions for rapid decarbonization of the economy, um, really to help safeguard public health um, as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here presenting today. I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. One of the greatest casualties of the COVID-19 pandemic has been the devastating impact on hunger and food insecurity worldwide. Projections show that the number of people experiencing severe hunger could actually double to 265 million people by the end of 2020. And we may be facing famine in more than 30 countries. Global leaders have been afraid that more people will die from the consequences of COVID-19 such as starvation and economic instability, then of the disease itself. There are many layers of interaction between the pandemic and food insecurity. First, you have the pre-existing structural context that drives food insecurity, and this includes things like health, racial, and social disparities, conflict and political instability, climate shocks, such as drought and excessive rains, and economic instability. And because of these things, even before COVID, more than a quarter of the world's population did not have regular access to safe, sufficient, and nutritious food. Then the COVID-19 pandemic introduces additional food insecurity-related stressors. And these include our unprecedented economic crisis that's been creating historic levels of unemployment, food system and supply chain disruptions due to things like border closures and worker illness, that can cause food scarcity, inflate food prices, and reduce food quality. And we also have stressed and overburdened healthcare systems that may be unable to treat patients with non-COVID related conditions. At the household and individual level, the pandemic then worsens food insecurity through two additional mechanisms. You have financial instability stemming from things like job loss and rising healthcare costs and social isolation, which can undermine help seeking from social networks. Importantly, access to government and non-governmental aid can really help mitigate these individual and household level effects. So just to give some specific examples, in the United States, data from the Census Bureau found that food insecurity rates at least doubled overall and tripled for families with children just in the first few months of the pandemic and modeling scenarios based on unemployment rates project 17 million newly food insecure people, which is a 45% increase from 2018 if we do not implement a robust and sustained stimulus response. In India, a survey of rural households in 12 states in April found that 50% said that they reduced their number of meals and 84% said that they received government food aid. As stated by David Beasley, who's the executive director of the World Food Program, we are headed towards a humanitarian and food catastrophe. Demand for food aid has also been surging worldwide. For example, Feeding America, the nation's largest food bank network, 
reported that food banks gave 20% more food aid in March compared to typical years, and roughly two in five people were seeking help for the very first time. So I've talked about how COVID-19 can worsen food insecurity. And this issue is particularly troublesome because food insecurity worsens health in the context of COVID-19 illness. So specifically, food insecurity can act through behavioral, nutritional, and mental health pathways to increase susceptibility to the virus and worsen COVID-19 outcomes once affected, and can also accelerate other chronic diseases. Finally, you see that the vicious cycle continues because COVID-19 illness can contribute to disability and out-of-pocket health expenses, which can then further exacerbate food insecurity. So starting with how food insecurity can accelerate or exacerbate risk of acquiring SARS-CoV-2 infection, we know that food insecure individuals may feel forced to engage in coping behaviors to get food or money that could increase their risk of exposure. For example, they may feel like they have no choice but to exchange sex um, to avoid hunger, or they may feel financial pressure to continue working in high-risk jobs during the pandemic. Food insecurity can also weaken host defense mechanisms and contribute to immunological decline through nutrient deficiencies and stress, which can then increase susceptibility to, to SARS-CoV-2. So in terms of food insecurity contributing to morbidity, we know that food insecurity is associated with higher levels of inflammatory markers, and this is likely related to both pro-inflammatory dietary patterns and stress-induced inflammation. And then we know that the body's inflammatory response in turn is an important factor in COVID-19 disease severity. Also, food insecurity can force already financially strapped individuals to prioritize food over medications or medical care, which then prevents them from seeking care for either COVID-related symptoms or chronic illness in a timely manner. It's important to note that food insecurity is an incredibly important driver of chronic illness worldwide. It contributes to diabetes, hypertension, HIV, higher odds of obesity, obstructive airway disease, and chronic kidney disease. And as you know, these are the very comorbidities that put people at higher risk of severe COVID-19 illness. Racial and ethnic minorities already experience disproportionate rates of both food insecurity and chronic illness. And this may help explain, at least in part, some of the stark racial disparities in COVID-19 morbidity and mortality we've been seeing. Considering how widespread and entrenched food insecurity is, it really needs to be incorporated into all aspects of the pandemic response and for the entire duration of the pandemic. Relief bills should include substantially increased governmental and non-governmental food assistance. We also need generous non-food aid, such as guaranteed paid sick leave, cash payments, and rent or, rent or mortgage delays. And we need coverage of vulnerable populations, including refugees, native communities, undocumented workers, farm laborers, and those who are incarcerated. Clinicians should be playing a key role in improving food insecurity by screening patients at every clinical encounter and referring food insecure individuals for food assistance. Finally, we should help drive structural change by investing in things like livelihood interventions, urban and community gardens, and other longer term strategies that can help build sustainable local economies and food systems. The COVID-19 era provides an opportunity to test and implement evidence-based food security interventions. For example, there's a growing body of evidence around food as medicine, which is a package of interventions that aims to improve nutrition and health among chronically ill individuals. And it includes things like food pharmacies, produce prescriptions, and medically tailored groceries and meals. These interventions have been shown in studies to improve diabetes management, cardiovascular events, and to lower hospital admissions and healthcare costs. We also need to consider interventions that could sustainably address the root causes of food insecurity, including things like cash transfers, economic strengthening, and livelihood interventions. 
For example, in Kenya, we conducted a climate adaptive livelihood intervention among people living with HIV, which gave households the tool to engage in sustainable subsistence farming. We found that the intervention improved food security, mental health, and HIV clinical indicators. And it also improved livelihoods and is well suited to pandemic conditions by accommodating social distancing. In summary, we've seen that the syndemic of food insecurity and COVID-19 is catastrophic for health and well-being globally. There has never been a more urgent time for action. Thank you very much. Dear friends, the pandemic of COVID-19 reminded us of the importance of not taking democracy for granted. The impressive spread of the disease is changing many realities and amongst them, the political dynamics of governance and the balance between individual liberties and community well-being. On the one hand, the pandemic has forced governments around the world to provide exceptional responses to a challenging context. The crisis, indeed, has cornered many governments to assume emergency powers and adopt measures both for protecting the economy and shielding the most marginal and vulnerable in societies, but at the same time, harshly restricting democratic rights. On the other hand, civil society has emerged not only as a powerful democratic watchdog denouncing abuses and shortcomings, but also taking a leading role in the recovery process. The result of these two processes, although not completely clear yet, is pointing towards a rather ambivalent situation. Even though democracy has been further restrained by the coronavirus pandemic and the political ramifications of it will be significant in the long run, the coronavirus crisis can also provide a fertile ground for a very much needed democratic reform, strengthening civil society, accountability and transparency, counterbalancing the concentration of power and the authoritarian drift in some countries. In another letter I recently signed as part of a group of 28 global leaders convened by the Kofi Annan Foundation, we called for extraordinary measures to fight the pandemic, ensuring that democracy does not become its silent victim. When dealing with authoritarian decisions, fake news and disinformation, we argue that the media and civil society, among other actors, are instrumental in terms of preventing democratic erosion by monitoring policy, fostering debates and shining a light on critical issues. Moreover, we argued that public trust is essential to address the health and economic crisis, and to that end, the major strength of democracy is its capacity to correct itself. Authoritarian regimes and the so-called illiberal democracies are taking advantage of this crisis to erode freedoms and fight checks and balances. Repression seems to take a new and worrisome context legitimacy and limitations on the role of parliaments and a weak judicial oversight seems to be at hand. In large measure, the pandemic has only exposed and radicalized pre-existing flaws of the democratic world. One of them has to do with the uh, largely ignored uh, social inequality democracies failed to tackle before. For instance, while a minority of people living in democracies uh, in the global south has been able to work remotely, the majority of workers belonging to an essential workforce in both cities and rural areas have risked themselves to put food on the table. The same is true with uh, indigenous and rural communities without access to running water. In a nutshell, the wealth and opportunities gap should be severely addressed by democracies in order not to endanger democracy itself. The idea that we are all facing the consequences of the pandemic, although true, in its most basic form, should bear in mind that we are actually not all experiencing it in the same way. Whereas a huge number of people are experiencing hardships 
others can isolate at home without worrying for future income considerations. Father will, with entire families in lockdown, abuses in the domestic arena are going up, and public security and social tissue concerns also arises, particularly in those regions where lack of trust in government combines with structural weaknesses of these states. That is why I believe scrutinizing the governmental responses to the pandemic, demanding accountability and transparency, empowering civil society to call for a new approach to our social inequalities and identifying abuses to democratic freedoms for the sake of sanitary security will be crucial for a new social contract of democratic governments. Based on principles of solidarity with people's immediate needs, involving all levels of government responsibilities in a close to citizen approach, and ensuring that people fully understand the risk of jeopardizing democracy, such social contracts should prioritize restoring confidence in the authorities emphasize social participation in public policy and propel democracy rights while confronting the dangers of misinformation and misperception. We can certainly emerge stronger from this crisis, but for that we need a new framework to simultaneously protect fundamental rights and democracy, public health and citizen security while decisively confronting social inequality and exclusion. Thank you. Well, please join me in thanking all these extraordinary speakers and our wonderful keynote, uh, the Honorable Mary Robinson, for what really was an extraordinary session. I think taken together, uh, we, we all now have a better understanding of the fact that COVID-19 has affected virtually every aspect of human life on this planet, uh, that it has had profound uh, and ongoing, as we know, uh, consequences in economic life, in social life, uh, on the environment, on food security, and of course it has had enormous political impact. While there are so many challenges and we are still so much in the thick of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, indeed, uh, this very time while we're, while we're speaking to each other, the United States is going through the largest number of cases we have ever seen, over 50,000 uh, documented cases a day, and so many other countries are coming into the most serious phase of the pandemic. I think it's also clear from our speakers that uh, this is an unprecedented moment for humanity, and it is potentially an extraordinary moment uh, to really rethink the way our global structures have been working, our global economic system has been working or not working. This is an opportunity to think about the ways in which the human pause has allowed an extraordinary uh, environmental recrudescence uh, that nature has uh, come remarkably back. And people all over the world are living in cities where they can see their mountain ranges again for the first time in decades. Uh, and where the sound of bird song uh, is really sometimes the loudest thing we hear. Um, it is uh, a terrible, reality to have lost so many precious human lives and to know that we're going to lose more human lives uh, to this pandemic. But it is also an opportunity for us to consider what is the post-COVID world we all want to live in? Will it be a, a place of greater global solidarity, of declining income inequality, of expanding social justice? Will it be a world where we finally pay attention to climate change? and to the existential threats that we face, uh, uh, all of us face living on this planet, uh, and indeed that we have imposed on the planet herself. Uh, I think these speakers have given us a window into really thinking about what, what life is going to look like after COVID-19. And as a scientist who's been working on infectious diseases now for coming on 30 years, 
I have to say that I really believe that in science, there is hope that we are going to conquer COVID-19 uh, and we are going to come out the other side of this. And it is my sincere wish that we all come out of it uh, facing a world that is much more aware of our common humanity, much more aware of the shared threats that we face and better prepared actually for uh, the next pandemic, which unfortunately history tells us is so likely to occur again. So once again, please join me in thanking all of these extraordinary speakers, our marvelous keynote speaker, Mary Robinson, and, uh, and please join me in, in uh, thinking together, all working together, uh, in how we might envision and bring into being uh, a post-COVID world that we all want to live in. Thank you so much for your attention.